five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. Hello everyone, my name is Scott Sorrell, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th installment of Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series. Today's Real Science webinar is titled, Feeding the Immunity Defenders, the Evolving Field of Nutritional Immunology, with Dr. Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. Dr. Bradford, the floor is now yours. Scott, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. This is a topic that I've become more and more interested in over the last decade and uh, can kind of hopefully share with you some of what I've learned through that process. And it's a, it's a field that's really catching on in, in animal science and has really been exploding, especially around cancer biology. And so I'll, I'll hopefully share some insights there and hopefully everyone can leave here with a few ideas of how to maybe apply some of this emerging field uh, to livestock production. So I'm gonna go through, first of all, just to make sure we're all on the same page, just a little bit of background on what the immune system's all about, as maybe not everybody uh, watching this has spent a lot of time studying immunology. Then I'll talk about what immu immunometabolism is, and that's sort of a newer term, uh, and there is kind of a subfield that's evolved around that on the human side, uh, and again, it's growing on the livestock side as well. So there's two aspects of that, two sides of that coin that we'll then spend time on, first of all, how does nutrient availability impact immunity? And the flip side of that is when the immune system is activated and we have an immune response, how does that affect metabolism? And then of course, um, those two things don't happen independently. It's, it's an integrated whole. And so we'll think a little bit about um, how that's integrated and what maybe are some applications in the whole animal. So first of all, uh, what does the immune system do? So we all are used to thinking about this. I always tell people, you know, I did my degree in animal science. I didn't do any veterinary school at all. And I, I used to say as an undergrad that I didn't want to deal with the sick animals, that, that that was for the veterinarians to deal with. I wanted to focus on making healthy animals more efficient. And that's still basically true. I have more interest than I used to in, in illness. But um, one thing I've learned is that sort of ignoring the immune system, even if you're focused on just healthy animals, is a big mistake because this uh, system is really integrally uh, involved in day-to-day -day regulation of physiology. So whether an animal is healthy or sick, the immune system is constantly monitoring, responding to bacteria, viruses, fungi, even uh, parasites that are in the environment. Um, and so again, this, this is not happening only when an animal's sick, but every single day. And so, of course, there's been tons of news and interest in the gut microbiome. Um, as people focused on ruminants, of course, we maybe recognize well before others how important that is. But even in the ruminant world, I think understanding that the hindgut microbiome is also very important. And now there's the virome, so that the viruses that live within the gut uh, you know, beyond the pathogenic ones, there are all kinds of microorganisms that the immune system is monitoring all the time, okay? So again, this is important at all times for all animals, um, but even beyond that, uh, you may not be as aware that the immune system is also important for uh, tissue maintenance, if you will. So um, you're probably familiar if you cut your arm and there's an open wound, the immune system is important for coming in and sort of clearing out any bacteria that find their way in there. You may be less familiar with the concept that the actual tissue repair itself is also dependent on immune cells. And so uh, maintenance of tissue um, seems to be a component of what the immune system does. And then I'll get into this a little bit, but the regulatory roles for the immune system for me at least, have been really surprising. Some of the things that people have found specifically around nutrient metabolism are not what I would have expected. And so that may open your eyes as I share some of that um, as to the importance of the immune system, again, for just day-to-day -day function of the animal. So the, the immune system is a little bit different 
from uh, many systems we identify in physiology in that it's not a focal organ or, or a couple organs that we can point to and sort of isolate. And it actually makes it really difficult to study immunity of animals um, because there's so many components that do so many different things and they're so diffuse throughout the body. Um, but we do have two general categories that we try to put immune components into. The first category is what we call innate immunity. Um, innate kind of refers to the idea that it's a sort of, uh, it's there from birth, it doesn't have to be trained, it's evolutionarily ancient, so animals, uh, you know, much less advanced than humans, if you will, um, contain some of these components. So this includes everything from your skin to the lining of your lungs and your gut, um, you know, providing a barrier just to help exclude pathogens. And that's actually arguably the most important component of the immune system. You maybe haven't thought of your skin as part of the immune system, but immunologists want to take credit for it. So that's one component. Um, there are uh, proteins in your bloodstream, such as uh, complement proteins um, and natural killer cells shown here at the bottom um, that are also involved in sort of uh, forming clusters around pathogens that might find their way into the body to help other cells identify and clear those uh, pathogens or to poke holes in them. The two that we talk about the most with the most prevalent dairy cattle diseases are uh, the phagocytic cells. And so that's mostly going to be neutrophils and macrophages. So we'll talk more about those later in this presentation. Um, but particularly for mastitis and metritis, neutrophils are really the most important cell type for coming in quickly and trying to clear out any pathogen before a true clinical disease can be established. So we really want to emphasize um, functional, healthy uh, neutrophils especially. Dendritic cells sort of are important for crosstalk and for sensing, particularly in the gut. The other half of the immune system uh, is what we call adaptive immunity or acquired immunity. Um, so on the very bottom here, you can see that um, if you think about the response to a challenge, the innate system, the sort of hardwired system, if you will, is really most important for sort of nipping something in the bud for the very early response in a lot of things that you and I see or our animals see, um, we never even notice because these cells that are sort of sitting there in tissues ready to pounce on an invader take care of things before we even recognize it. So you may have no fever response, no sort of response at all because it's just a minor uprising that's quelled quickly in the first 12 hours or so. Unfortunately, of course, not every pathogen is cleared that easily. Um, maybe they get a foothold, maybe they can sort of uh, overpower the first wave of response by the innate system. And then we have to kick in another set of responses, if you will. So um, this is where uh, acquired immunity or adaptive immunity comes in. So this is where learning by the immune system or memory uh, comes into play because both T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes shown here um, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, um, we can have what's called clonal expansion. So if we have a cell that has the right antibody or the right um, receptor on their cell to recognize a particular pathogen, there are systems in place where that cell essentially gets copied. Uh, and so, and that's the whole point of vaccinating. So if we vaccinate, we're introducing an antigen, we're helping B and T cells that have the right um, sensors in place to recognize that pathogen to be copied. And so we have lots of reserved copies then shown in the middle of this adaptive immunity piece um, that then when that pathogen shows up again, now we have a whole horse, host of uh, these lymphocytes available to either make lots of antibodies quickly against that pathogen or the T lymphocytes actually directly kill. So they uh, themselves are the ones floating around, recognizing that pathogen and wiping it out, okay? So two arms play different roles and kind of have different importance for different types of diseases also. All right, what, is, what do nutrients have to do with any of that? I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail. It just shows an example of kind of where a lot of the work on the biomedical side is focused right now. So one aspect of immunometabolism is what's called intrinsic immunometabolism. So what that means is this is under trying to understand how 
the availability of different nutrients um, influences the function of specific immune cells. And as I mentioned earlier, this has become especially hot in cancer biology. Now, cancer is, is kind of interesting because within a tumor, um, we not only have a, a, a cell type that's growing sort of unchecked and causing the tumor to grow, but because that growth is so rapid, uh, blood flow um, maybe can't keep up. At least in some parts of the tumor, um, there's a lack of blood flow. So that actually influences oxygen availability, influences nutrient availability. And so one of the reasons that we think that the immune system isn't good at wiping out tumors sometimes uh, is that because of that microenvironment where there's not adequate nutrients and oxygen, it changes the function of the immune cells that try to make it there. So this is one of the aspects that cancer therapy is focused on now. But there's also a lot of people, of course, interested in how these nutrient availability characteristics influence the ability of immune cells to fight off bacteria or viruses that we're more used to thinking about um, in livestock. Okay, so as of a lot of times the case with new areas of science is partly driven by technological innovations. So um, this is one brand of this, but it's the dominant one. So uh, this instrument called a seahorse um, came into play about maybe 15 years ago. And it's designed to allow you to put a bunch of cells in a Petri dish, if you will, or, or a multi-well uh, plate. Um, and it has these tiny electrodes, these sensors, um, that go in there and can actually measure um, oxygen consumption rate uh, of cells and essentially lactate in solution. So what it has allowed people to do is study how a very small number of immune cells function metabolically given different stimuli. And um, again, when you're dealing with cells that are dispersed throughout the body, you can't isolate an organ to study it in vivo. This has been kind of a game changing uh, technology for immunologists to be able to understand metabolism of the cells that they care about. Um, and this has really driven a lot of the excitement in this field. Okay, and here's one simple but important uh, learning I guess we've had through that technology. So what we've learned is if we activate different types of cells, metabolically they function pretty differently. The phag phagocytic cells, um, neutrophils, uh, and then monocytes, so they're in the bloodstream, they're largely going to turn into macrophages. Not all of them, but most of them will turn into macrophages. So we can generally say that on the right hand of this picture, we're looking at uh, phagocytic cells, cells that are gonna be engulfing bacteria and uh, eating them and destroying them. Um, those cells, when they're activated, they have a glycolytic metabolism. So they're breaking down glucose but just through anaerobic glycolysis. They're not actually utilizing mitochondria. Okay, so this are, allows them to crank through glucose very quickly, um, generate uh, energy and reducing equivalents for uh, generating reactive oxygen species at a, at a rapid rate. Um, it's inefficient for the animal, but it's uh, an efficient way to quickly generate ATP in these cell types. On the other hand, uh, lymphocytes, which are part of the adaptive immune system, and platelets, which we won't really get into in detail, but they tend to be more oxidative in their metabolism. So they're actually using mitochondria and getting more efficient utilization of glucose. So metabolically, these function quite differently. Okay. What does that actually mean? Well, to boil that down to a simpler point, if you're engaging the innate immune system, um, which the key way to do that is through inflammation. Um, we are going to really ramp up the use of glucose by cells in that innate immune system, particularly the phagocytes, the neutrophils and macrophages. Uh, on the adaptive side, yeah, they, they're gonna use glucose as well, but more efficiently, and the demand may not be as great. And here, um, they really like to use glutamine and amino acid uh, as a source of energy as well. And so there are actually some whole animal implications of this. This is more than just people playing with their, their cells in a Petri dish and, and uh, trying to publish from that. that uh, I'll show you that there may be some real meaningful uh, outcomes from these insights uh, for uh, dairy cattle. So one example of this, okay, I, I already mentioned this briefly, but 
just a graphic showing that in lymphocytes, when we're asking them to expand, for example, so again, these are the cells with memory that if we vaccinate, we want them to replicate the specific ones against that antigen. We want them to replicate uh, and become prevalent so that they can make antibodies or be there for cell-mediated killing if that pathogen shows up again. And so again, in, in when those cells are going from kind of a sleepy state to being activated and, and we want them to proliferate or to make more copies of themselves, uh, glutamine ap appears to be very important. Now, of course, glutamine is always available. It's not a, a yes, no, you can do that in a Petri dish, but in the animal, there's no animal ever that's gonna have zero glutamine available. Um, but we do have some evidence that the relative availability may actually influence the function of these cells within the physiological range. And this is a neat study um, done in Italy where they took 24 mid-lactation uh, Frisian cows. They happened to be in heat stress. That wasn't really the treatment, but just something to keep in mind. Um, and this gets a little technical, but there is a, a compound uh, found in nature called phytohemagglutinin. Um, and this basically angers the immune system. Uh, it, it's, it's somewhat like an adjuvant, but it's specific tends to in, induce a T cell response. Okay, so we're looking more at the adaptive immune system, less at the innate immune system. So the, the main treatment here was they either fed um, flaxseed, which is FS on this graphic here. So the, the second bar in each of these um, clusters is flax. Um, and then the last one, the white bar is uh, rumen protected glutamine. And then there was a combination treatment, which is the third, the darkest gray bar. So they gave this phytohemagglutinin to try to activate a T cell response and then monitored that over 60 days. Uh, and they, it's a pretty simple readout here. They just look at, at the place where they injected this, they can look at skin fold thickness. Um, so if they get some inflammation, some invasion of T cells there, um, then the, the skin is thick because there's uh, sort of a local inflammation and recruitment of cells. And what you can see, it wasn't obvious, of course, you know, the day of injection, that's kind of the baseline number. Um, it, it became obvious within both, both 30 days and continuing out for 60 days, uh, a greater skin fold thickness in the glutamine supplement in animals. Now, that was wiped out when they combined that with uh, flaxseed, which is an anti-inflammatory compound. So maybe that tells us something. But anyway, at least some insights that perhaps uh, if we can develop a sort of cost-effective um, rumen-protected glutamine product that we could actually feed, perhaps there's some strategies we could think about down the road in terms of, okay, I'm going to be vaccinating uh, at, say, dry-off, maybe the last two weeks before dry-off. I need to supplement glutamine so that I sort of ramp up my ability of my lymphocytes to respond uh, to that vaccination. So I don't know for sure if that would ever work, but those are the sorts of ideas that emerge from, from these kinds of studies. Uh, arginine is another amino acid that has a really prevalent role in the study of amino metabolism. So um, we have different types of macrophages. I haven't really talked about macrophages. I don't want to spend a ton of time, but I usually call these sort of the sentinel cells in most of our tissues. So dendritic cells are also in the gut. They're sentinels as well, but you know, in sort of under your skin, uh, within the organs, most organs in your body, there are different types of macrophages that are always there looking for signs of bacteria, looking for signs of viruses or, or fungi. And they're the ones that tend to send the first signals to sort of recruit in neutrophils or to activate lymphocytes if a further response is necessary. So these guys can actually engulf phagocytose uh, bacteria and kill them directly, but they also send out the signals. Okay. What's interesting is typically these are um, sitting in tissues in sort of a calm, quiescent state. They're, they're actually anti-inflammatory. They're trying to keep things sort of in homeostasis. Um, and that's what we call uh, the, the uh, M2 phenotype on the left here. You don't necessarily need to know that. But in this situation, in this phenotype, arginine uh, is important for sort of keeping that cell um, proliferating, just sort of growing normally and not doing anything too crazy. Oops, excuse me. Uh, on the other hand, in the presence of a pro-inflammatory stimulus like lipopolysaccharide, which we'll talk about a lot, um, 
that's going to cause uh, phenotype switching. So the, the same cell is there, but it goes from calm and happy to angry and activated. And we call that an M1 macrophage. And again, arginine needs to be there to allow the switch to occur because it's actually just switching downstream metabolism of arginine. So this is going to help generate nitric oxide, um, which potentiates bacterial killing and also helps recruit, also helps draw blood flow to that region. Uh, and it's going to turn off sort of the calming uh, aspects of arginine downstream metabolism. Okay, so the whole point is if you are trying to activate macrophages, there has to be adequate arginine there to allow this switch to occur. Again, does this have any whole body implications for dairy cattle? Again, small study, I wouldn't put too much weight on, but it's intriguing. So here's a study where they took uh, eight Holstein cows in late lactation and did a Latin square experiment. So each cow was going through each of these treatments. Um, and they did a, a two by two factorial. So cows either got intravenous infusion of arginine um, for a long time, uh, or they got sort of continuous low grade LPS challenges, inflammatory challenges over basically two weeks. At the end of that two weeks, then they first of all looked at some signals. So these are all cytokines. These are signals made by immune cells to signal to other immune cells to activate them. And these are all pro-inflammatory cytokines. So interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all pro-inflammatory cytokines. They're ramping up an inflammatory response. And not a lot of statistical significance here. Um, for IL-6, there tended to be a decrease when arginine was added to the LPS. So as you'd expect, there's an increase with LPS in inflammatory cytokines, but infusing arginine at the same time seemed to minimize that inflammatory response to some extent. Okay, kind of interesting. Maybe there's something there, a little hard to tell, but the more interesting is the actual whole body responses here. So if you look simply at dry matter intake and fat-corrected milk yield, those cows given LPS over 15 days, kind of that chronic inflammatory challenge, had about 10-15% uh, drop in feed intake and uh, more like a 40% drop in milk yield, which is very consistent with many, many, many studies that have done something like this. What's interesting and surprised me when I first found this paper is that infusing arginine at the same time basically eliminated this suppression of intake and at least statistically um, prevented the drop in milk yield as well. So pretty interesting. Again, not going to totally hang my hat on that, but what? how could we maybe think about this down the road? Um, there are a lot of whole body effects of arginine, not just on the immune system, but a lot of them would point to some potential for arginine to help animals during, say, heat stress when we have both inflammatory challenge and direct heat stress problems that arginine might help address. But again, a lot of this uh, application of this is dependent on perhaps rumen protected uh, development of, of feed products like that. Okay, so amino acids are important largely because they're substrates. They're nutrients that are utilized by the cell, processed into something else, or actually used as an energy source. And so nutrients are certainly important as substrates. No question. And I'm not even going to talk about vitamins and minerals, which are cofactors. Uh, there's tons of literature. We've known a lot about that for a long time. Selenium, vitamin E, vitamin D, all important in immunity. I'm not even touching on that today. Um, what we now know, what's newer, is this idea that beyond being substrates and cofactors, nutrients can act basically like hormones. Okay. And it started really with long chain fatty acids, so omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. Um, it became known that they were actually acting as signals, kind of acting like hormones. But now there's been 20 years of work in that space. And we know that even minerals um, can signal like a hormone. They can actually bind to a receptor on the outside of a cell, not even enter the cell and change its physiology. Um, and this to me has is, is been the biggest game changing um, insight in nutrition uh, in my lifetime. And I think it's going to continue to be something that's going to change the story about how we think about nutrients probably for decades to come. So are there nutrients that can affect the immunity or the immune system of a cow, perhaps even if they're not being utilized as a substrate uh, by the immune cells? So I want to talk through kind of that general concept and how we can study that. 
So uh, I'm going to walk through, um, first of all, how can we ask these questions in a clean way? So one issue with feeding a nutrient to cows and just seeing how does immunity change is there's many ripple effects, right? And of course, that's the system we ultimately care about. But I'm, I'm going to focus for a minute on choline. So we have some studies. Um, uh, Jose Santos, for example, has done a, uh, you know, a study a number of years ago where they fed an, on a large scale setting, uh, fed rumen protected choline or not during the transition period. And yeah, they found an improvement in metabolic health, as you would expect, but maybe somewhat surprisingly, they also saw a decrease in incidence of mastitis. So that's interesting. Uh, as far as I know, there was no direct mechanism pointing to why that would be. But perhaps you can just explain that through better metabolic function. You prevented fatty liver, ketosis, maybe that's why it was better. So it's complicated to try to figure out how it's working. And I think at some level that does matter. So to try to get at that in a more clean way, we can actually ask what happens with immune cells that we take out of the body if we expose them to some of these nutrients. Okay, so simple experimental design. We, we take a handful of, of dairy cows, um, do jugular bleeding, and then we um, mix that blood with a, a heavy compound called FICOL. And all this is doing is when we centrifuge it, then it's separating out um, different components of the blood by density. And that FICOL gives us a very clear split between um, the red blood cells and polymorphonuclear cells in the very bottom fraction, the most dense fraction. Um, and at that point, then we can introduce a um, hypertonic solution that lyses the red blood cells, they explode. Um, we wash them, get rid of the red blood cell uh, detritus, if you will. And then what we're left with are these PMNs, the polymorphonuclear cells. What does that mean? It's a huge word, just means they're unusual cells in that they have more than one nucleus. And you can see in this little picture here that says three nuclei. It's not really three nuclei, but it's three segments of the nucleus that are kind of split up. So these are for the most part neutrophils. So I get lazy sometimes, and I'm just gonna call them neutrophils, but that's mostly what they are. So that's one fraction that a lot of people study. Then there's another fraction here between the plasma and that FICOL layer uh, called mononuclear cells. So mononuclear, they have one nucleus. Um, this is a mix of cells. It's going to include both the adaptive lymphocytes, B and T lymphocytes, and also the monocytes, which I said are mostly going to turn into macrophages and tissues later. Okay. So it gives us two pools of cells that we can study. And we can go on and, and manipulate them, hit them with different stimuli, see how they respond. So here, here's a study we published about a year and a half ago where we just asked if we take some of these cells, incubate them with no additional choline, just the background choline in the media, um, five micromolar choline added or 10 micromolar choline added, how do these animal or how do these cells respond when we stimulate them? So here we've stimulated um, monocytes, so the, the future macrophages um, simplistically, we stimulated them with LPS, again, that inflammatory compound from gram-negative bacteria. And what we found was, if we look at that inflammatory cytokine, TNF-alpha, in the media, and we also looked at some gene expression that was consistent with this, it suggested that adding choline to these cells directly in the absence of the rest of the systems actually calmed the monocytes, made them less inflammatory in response to LPS from gram-negative bacteria. If we look at a different cell type, that same mononuclear fraction, we split out the lymphocytes, and this is going to be mostly T lymphocytes. Um, we stimulate them with a different uh, compound called CON-A that um, specifically causes T cell proliferation. And again, we looked at what happens if we progressively add more choline. So this is the control with CON-A. So you can see CON-A caused a big jump in proliferation or copying of these cells. Um, but adding more choline substantially increased the proliferation rate beyond that in, in the presence of con A. Okay, so we're seeing a calming of the inflammatory innate cells, but an amplifying of the proliferation of the adaptive immune cells in the presence of choline, which is pretty interesting. It's not a general one-size-fits-all enhancement or suppression of activity. It's a shift in focus because of the presence of choline. 
Now, it's, it is a simpler system to have these cells in culture and take the rest of the organ systems of the body out of the equation, but we also asked, well, do we get metabolism of choline in these cells? And what we found is when we added choline, both in neutrophils and monocytes, um, we see an upregulation of almost, in almost all cell types, of all the metabolic downstream tools for converting choline to other products. So we see more choline transporter when choline is present. We see more choline acetyltransferase and dehydrogenase and kinase, allowing choline to be used to make betaine, phosphatidylcholine, acetylcholine, and even the receptors for acetylcholine are upregulated. So it's still a complicated story because we don't really know if choline is directly having these effects, but probably one of these four products through some of these mediators ultimately are causing uh, an anti-inflammatory shift in the innate immune cells and a greater proliferation of lymphocytes when choline is present. So again, what does that mean the whole animal is more complicated, but we do know now that at least providing choline um, through some kind of signaling, it's shifting the function of both innate and adaptive immune cells. Another nutrient or metabolite um, that's, of course, very important in dairy cattle is beta-hydroxybutyrate, or uh, BHBA. Um, of course, BHB is the most studied ketone body, and it's greatly uh, enhanced or greatly uh, increased in concentration in animals with ketosis. So a lot of transition dairy cows would have at least a doubling of ketone bodies in the first week or two after calving. And that's just a, comes along with uh, rapid body weight loss, body fat mobilization, and the metabolism of that fat. Okay. Well, so people have asked now for for at least a decade, what happens to immune cells isolated in the same way if we add BHB to their solution to their media? And you can see, at least in this study by Grinberg and others, um, that ramping up BHB from sort of baseline concentrations up to the clinical ketosis range really suppresses phagocytosis, um, which is engulfing a bacteria, and then killing outside of the cell by neutrophils. So these are both um, data from neutrophils isolated from dairy cows, showing a great diminishment of their function um, when incubated with BHB. But again, it's a simplistic system. It's not the whole animal. So what actually happens um, in the body? of a dairy cow if we can artificially increase BHB, does it actually change the response to mastitis? So this is really new data and I give uh, almost all the credit here to Turner Schwartz who's doing a postdoc with me right now. We did this work when we were finishing up at Kansas State University. Um, so we took 12 late lactation cows and randomly assigned them to either be IV infused with BHB to target to clamp DHB at 1.8 millimolar, which is sort of safely above the subclinical ketosis threshold, but not really close to the clinical ketosis uh, threshold. Or we infused an equal uh, molar concentration of saline at the same rate uh, for 72 hours straight. So for three days, they either got elevated ketones or not. And then at the same time that we started that infusion, um, two, two of the quarters got strep uberis uh, uh, challenge to initiate uh, mastitis. So first of all, just to show you that our treatment uh, worked, uh, on the left axis here is BHB concentration, and that's um, showing data on the blue and red lines. So this bottom line here is the control cows just infused with saline. You can see they stuck right around about uh, uh, 0.55 millimolar BHB throughout, which is equivalent to 5.7 milligram per deciliter and no real change through that window of time. The clamped cows, uh, the BHB cows, um, took us a little while to settle in, but by the end, by the last, uh, say, day and a half or two days, we stayed pretty consistently right around 1.8 millimolar BHB, so we hit our targets pretty well. So we saw about a three-fold elevation of BHB, um, and on the, on the right side here uh, is the infusion rate in the black line, so we were infusing about 250 milliliters per hour to get that done. So what did we find? Pretty exciting results here. So by day three, post-inoculation, um, we were already starting to see a significant increase in um, the CFUs of the strep uberus 
in milk from cows that were infused with BHB. And um, even though we stopped treatment at the end of day three, um, by day seven, there was a massive change, a massive difference, about a six log greater abundance of viable strep uberus uh, in milk from the cows that had been infused with BHB compared to controls. And if you look at the body temperature, another very simple physiological measure here, uh, the control animals recognized the pathogen and started responding with inflammatory response to activate the immune system, at least by day three. So you can see they had nearly a one degree Celsius jump in body temperature on that day. And you can see then they turned it around pretty quickly, which is why if we go back to the CFUs, we never really saw a dramatic spike in CFUs. The control animals basically managed this infection. And if this happened in your barn, you might not have ever noticed that these cows were really that sick at all. The BHB cows never saw that spike in fever. And you might say, again, clinically, oh, that's good. Well, it's good unless she needs that fever to activate her immune system, right? So what we're seeing is there's no inflammatory response or no obvious one anyway. And because then the, the bacteria are continuing to expand, finally by day six and seven, when we've removed the BHB treatment, now she's finally having an inflammatory response and trying to get a hold on this. But by this point, of course, there's four or six logs more bacteria there. So it's a much bigger battle to wage. So pretty exciting results. Um, it really does, in my mind, point to a really clear impact of BHB uh, in animals that are hit with a disease challenge. So I think this may really underlie some of the connections between ketosis and infectious disease that we see in dairy cattle epidemiologically. So this is data we're gonna continue building out the story in the lab right now, and hopefully we'll be publishing this uh, soon. So to wrap up, that's kind of the story that I have time for today on intrinsic. So this is again, focused on nutrients impacting the immune cells themselves. Um, and many nutrients can have effects here. So I talked about choline and BHB, many, many others can be a part of this. What about the flip side then? How does the immune system actually influence metabolism of an animal? Um, and there's a lot of this emerging now. So I'm not gonna go into this figure, but this is just an example of adipose tissue having lots of different immune cells sitting there all the time in a healthy animal affecting how, these cell, how this tissue functions. So I start off with, you know, why would it be that the immune system's involved at all in metabolism of a healthy animal? Well, this is a really interesting perspective. Um, a guy at Harvard has written on this extensively and talks about if you study Drosophila fruit flies, um, I guess you would know that they have an organ called a fat body, which actually encompasses immune cells woven into fat cells, essentially adipocytes, woven into other cells that function like liver cells. And his point is that evolutionarily, these functions have been split into different organs and um, sort of geographically split up. But in terms of their crosstalk and their signaling and their interactions, um, it's still there. It's just that these signals in us or in a cow have to travel through the bloodstream instead of directly signaling side by side. Um, but if you think about it this way, it makes a whole lot of sense that immune cells are still talking to liver cells, are still talking to adipose cells, and really influence how nutrients are used in the whole body. Now that might be especially important uh, in a transition dairy cow where we know inflammation and activation of the immune system is very, very common. So we, we've done some studies, and I'm just gonna share one here quickly where we asked, what if we induce a, a mild increase in inflammation to try to cause some stimulation of immune responses? Um, what does that do to liver metabolism? So I'll share one study. We used late lactation cows in this study um, to minimize variation between animals and try to get a more clear answer. We did subcutaneous injection once daily for seven days of either saline, TNF-alpha, this, this uh, inflammatory cytokine, but given at a very low dose where we didn't cause an increase in body temperature, um, no change in behavior consistent with sickness, we're causing a very subtle subacute inflammation. And then we did a pair-fed control group where any minimalization or any drop in feed intake from that TNF group, we matched in this group. And just to share one outcome, we were really focused at the time on fatty liver, 
Um, and what we found with that TNF treatment for just seven days is basically we doubled liver triglyceride content uh, and we didn't see that in the pear fed group. So it wasn't because of appetite suppression. And we, we looked at mRNA in the liver and looked at key enzymes involved in metabolizing fatty acids. Um, we found more than a doubling of the key transporter for getting uh, free fatty acids into the cells. Um, we saw a 30% decrease in carnitine palmitoyl transferase, which actually moves fatty acids into mitochondria to break them down. Um, the acyl transferase that builds triglycerides was more than five-fold upregulated, and there was no increase in apolipoproteins for getting lipoproteins out of the cell. And so perhaps not surprisingly, when we see gene expression responses like this, um, you know, you're going to accumulate triglycerides. So this suggested to us that this mild inflammatory challenge really shifted liver metabolism towards a uh, fatty liver type phenotype. This is mouse work, but uh, also indicating that immune cells themselves are maybe important for regulating adipose tissue function. So in this study, they showed that if you um, fast mice and get a jump in release of fatty acids from adipose tissue, that actually causes macrophages to be recruited into that organ, to the adipose tissue, and that somehow those macrophages are giving a, sort of putting the brakes on fatty acid release a little bit, slowing down lipolysis. So they're actually having a regulatory effect on lipolysis in the absence of any kind of immune challenge. This is just normal fasting. And just to show you that data quickly, one tool they use is called Clondronate, and it's fairly specific toxin for macrophages. So they use this to wipe out macrophages. And first they did that in adipose tissue taken out of the animal. And you can see that after that, um, more glycerol was released from that tissue, which is another product of lipolysis. And even in an intact animal then, they used clodronate in living mice, uh, allowed the macrophages to die, and then fasted them, uh, fasted the mice. And you can see that the free fatty acid release in response to fasting almost doubled. Uh, when there were no macrophages in the system anymore. So pretty fascinating. Again, immune cells are important for normal day-to-day -day regulation of metabolism, not just during disease, okay? But we also want to know how, how does metabolism change during disease? So I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here, but there are many ways that uh, disease alters metabolism. Um, one thing I'll talk about again in a second, is just less nutrient availability because of decreased appetite for many types of diseases. Uh, but there are other costs as well. So let's think about that for a minute. So if we think about this in a sort of a resource graph here, um, in, the, in the presence of an immune challenge, um, not all immune challenges, but many diseases would actually cause a suppression of appetite, which is gonna decrease the influx of nutrients and then we're gonna use more nutrients for immune function as well. And so something has to give here. So we can sacrifice some energy stores. Um, adipose is gonna come first. Um, we can sacrifice growth or, or other maintenance uh, things if things get real bad. Um, but certainly one of the major things that's gonna lose out in terms of resources is reproduction and lactation. So what is the real cost? And this, I get this question a lot, uh, a lot of times sort of back of napkin calculations on feed additives that are meant to improve immunity are sort of based on, oh, you don't want to waste energy for immune responses. But actually dialing in what is the cost of an immune response is very difficult because immune response can mean everything from having a minor cold where you're sneezing a little bit to fighting for your life, right? Um, and so, there's actually, it's, it's pretty difficult to measure this properly. Um, this is a nice review that kind of looked at studies that have been done across different species. And generally, if you want to come up with a rule of thumb, I usually say about a 25% increase in basal metabolic rate for a moderately serious immune challenge, okay? Um, keep in mind, basal metabolic rate in a cow is only about 25% of her total energy burn because about three-fourths is going to milk in a high-producing dairy cow. Okay, so put it on that scale, maybe we're talking about a 8% you know, increase in total energy cost or, or demand. And the bigger hit probably in that case then is going to be a suppression of appetite. So if a cow gets toxic mastitis and she sort of completely goes off feed for 12 hours, 
that's a much bigger nutrient deficiency than the increase in the immune system demand, probably. Okay, but they're both important and they add together, of course. What about essential amino acids? So this is actually Kurt Clasing's uh, summary from poultry work, but I think it's relevant at least for to give us an idea. So he studied how uh, poultry respond to immune challenges. They need about 2% more essential amino acids for immune cells to replicate, maybe 1% more for them to be more active, but about 9% more for what's called the acute phase response. And this has been studied a lot in cows. This, these are the markers that we use to look at inflammation in transition cows uh, and their proteins. And so the liver is cranking out a lot more of these proteins that are sort of involved in the immune response. And um, so that may well drive up our essential amino acid requirements and, and be part of the story with trade-offs between different systems in the body. And in fact, we have data in growing steers that immediately after an LPS challenge, we see rapid drops in circulating free amino acids. So this is tryptophan within 12 hours after, well, actually within four to six hours after LPS, um, free tryptophan drops by about half in the bloodstream. And you can look at leucine, isoleucine, all these other amino acids and see similar patterns. So big shift in availability of free amino acids there for at least a short period of time. Um, another nutrient we've already kind of gotten into, but I'm gonna circle back now. We talked about glucose being really important for phagocytic cells when they're activated to kill bacteria with. Um, they use glucose through glycolysis alone and crank through it quickly. Now, when we give LPS to a lactating cow, and this is work from, uh, Sarah Kavidra, Lance Baumgard's group, um, we see a big jump in blood glucose initially, and this is mostly due to release of all the stored glycogen in the liver. Maybe not all, but probably most of it. So the liver is responding. It knows there's going to be a huge demand for glucose by the immune system. It's pushing out what it can. But that gets used up basically by two to three hours post-challenge, and then there's typically a big longer window of time where some hypoglycemia occurs. So this bar here is LPS challenge cows um, that nothing else happened to. They then said, well, what if we infuse glucose to keep that um, glucose drop from occurring in the, in the 12 hours after the challenge? And then they added up, if you account for the drop in milk yield, which even the controls had some drop just because these cows were being pestered constantly, um, if you add up the drop in milk lactose yield and the glucose that had to be infused to maintain a, a constant blood glucose of about 62 milligram per deciliter, that adds up. Even if you subtract the control out, that's over 1,000 grams for that 12-hour window. So you're looking at about two kilos of additional glucose demand to maintain normal calcium concentration, sorry, normal glucose concentrations in blood for a 24-hour window. Now, this is a relatively extreme challenge. Not every cow that gets sick is gonna have that kind of response, but it does tell us the magnitude of the glucose draw if you really ramp up the immune system, okay? And Matt Waldron did something similar, but actually used tracers to, to look at glucose turnover rate. And he had a pretty similar story. After LPS, um, it, it peaked at about you know four hours after that challenge. Uh, up to a 33% increase in glucose appearance, which had to be coming from the liver. So even in this animal where glucose production in the liver is so high already, they're ramping it up even more. So um, as I wrap up here, one more point to make, whoops, sorry. Because these uh, challenges ramp up use of certain nutrients, um, we may have nutrient requirements that are conditional. So only showing up during times of challenge. So two pieces of evidence here, one in growing pigs. This is showing that in normal pigs, um, a sulfur amino acid to lysine ratio of 0.55 was adequate to get maximum growth, protein growth per day in this study. But in pigs that were challenged with LPS twice a week, they not surprisingly showed a decrease in, in gain, but actually if they crank that sulfur amino acid to lysine ratio up to 0.75, they covered the normal rate of gain. So essentially by adding methionine, um, they wiped out the negative effect of LPS on growth, which is kind of amazing to me. 
Um, likewise, if we think about requirements based not only on growth, but also on immunity, we might shift what we think about. So here, pretty old study, but um, birds given a Newcastle virus, um, those consuming 1% valine had maximal uh, weight gain. But if they also looked at antibody titer against that, back, that virus um, in considering what the requirement should be, um, they might have said for optimal immunity, we should actually feed 1.5% valine. So rather than thinking only about milk yield, for example, and dairy cows and how we feed them, should we also be considering somehow assessing immune response? Okay, sorry I got a little long here, but to wrap up, two big points. One, intrinsic immunity is the, the study of how nutrients affect immune cells and their function. Extrinsic metabolism is how does the immune system actually influence metabolism by the rest of the body? And both, in my mind, have been surprising in terms of the things they've revealed. But I think what's really important as nutritionists or, or people managing dairy cows is to think about the interaction of these two and how many challenges do our cows have and how does that influence the overall annual you know, feed efficiency and utilization of nutrients by our cows, not only looking at them in the healthiest times, but the whole system and are there ways to shift the way we feed um, to make them more resilient and efficient? So Scott, I uh, apologize going a little long there, but hopefully we have time for a few questions still. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Barry. And before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief one minute video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. The heat of summer is coming, and it can have a big impact on your cows. Niacher Precision Release Niacin is the perfect complement to traditional heat abatement strategies to help keep her cool from the inside. Using Balcom's proprietary encapsulation process, Niacher delivers eight times more bioavailability than raw niacin, leading to an increase in sweating and vasodilation to reduce internal body temperature and support maximum productivity. Learn more at balcamanh.com cool and keep her cool from the inside. Dr. Bradford, our first question is, in your work to date, is there any one area of focus that holds a uh, key to better health and performance, for example, focus on innate versus adaptive response factors or impact on energetics on health and some other areas? Well, that's a good question. Um, to, because it's so directly relevant to a real world on-farm scenario, I'm probably as excited about the BHB study I showed as anything because um, I, I think it's still controversial based on in vitro studies whether BHB really suppresses immunity, but I think this is pretty eye-opening and, and it does to me justify um, a little bit in terms of how we approach transition cow management because I don't think ketones always cause cows to crash, but this maybe suggests that this is directly relevant to immunity. Um, but I also think a uh, low-hanging fruit that really nobody's gotten into is um, nutritional management uh, just around immunity. So if you have a sick pen, does anybody actually feed those cows differently? I mean, I don't even know what to tell you you should do, but we should start looking at that. Uh, and again, supplementing around vaccination. There's so much opportunity there. Maybe nothing will pan out, but I, I think there's a lot of things that we should be sniffing into. All right, thank you. Uh, Rodrigo asks, in transition cows, should calcium requirements also, requirements also be increased to support immune response? Yeah, good question, Rodrigo. So um, I think the story around uh, normal calcemia and immune function is quite strong. Um, a couple groups, Jose Santos group comes to mind, have done some really nice studies showing that cows that have um, natural hypocalcemia uh, have poorer immune function, but they also then showed that if you cause hypocalcemia, the indicators of immune function get worse. And so pretty, pretty strong evidence there. Um, does that mean that the requirements need to go up? I'm not sure. 
because um, if she's normally regulating calcium and using bone stores as she needs to, I'm not sure that our requirements that we have established uh, really need to change. It's about getting calcium into the system during that transient period where the requirements jump so quickly. So I wouldn't necessarily say requirements, but more about using DCAD or other strategies to, to maintain normal calcemia in that window uh, of time after calving. All right, thank you. My favorite question of the day is gonna take you a little bit, I think, out of your comfort zone, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Uh, Colin uh, says, he says, I have a daughter with CFS, and I'm gonna interpret that to mean chronic fatigue syndrome. Is there hope that this technology and knowledge can be mirrored in humans? Wow, uh, yeah, out of my comfort zone for sure. So uh, what I would say is you do have to be careful. So if you just Google, um, healthy immune system and like supplement, <laughs> you can find insane levels of quackery online of companies trying to get rich, selling people all kinds of everything under the sun um, that you can take. And to be honest, I think a lot of these things, there may be some real relevance to them, but the underlying work to know the right dose, uh, to know, you know, the, the right formulation to get these things absorbed and that sort of thing, it has really not been done. I mean, essential oils are a great example of that. Um, I, I do think a lot of them are, are really potent biological agents, but we don't really know whether the dose that people say you should take is a toxic dose versus a therapeutic dose. And so, okay, I, I know almost nothing about CFS, so I hesitate to say much of anything, but I do think in the long run, there is a lot of promise here, uh, but we have a long ways to go. And the nice thing when you work with livestock is, it's much easier to do controlled studies than it is when you're focused on humans. So that's that's the frustration on the human side, I think. All right, thank you for that. Our next uh, question comes from James. Is there a marker in blood that can be used on farm to assess immune challenge size status in transition cows? Yeah, there, so good question. I get that a lot. I don't have a, a great answer. and particularly if you say on farm and you're talking about um, doing something where you get a readout right away, which I would love to have. Um, so that, for example, you knew if you should give her an anti-inflammatory agent right away. Um, I would say no to that one. I don't, we're not there. Um, I have engaged with some veterinary groups around the world trying to use haptoglobin, which has been the most common biomarker used by researchers. Um, you can get turnaround within an hour if you invest in an instrument um, or within a couple days if you use a veterinary diagnostic lab. But that's more, I think currently, that's more useful to get sort of herd level metrics. In other words, is your transition cow program dealing with a lot of relatively high inflammation or not? I think from that standpoint, it's useful. I think on a cow to cow basis right now, we don't have the technologies that are giving data quick enough to really be all that helpful. Um, but there's a lot of people working on that. And I think in the next decade, we may get there. All right, thank you. And the next uh, question comes from Christina. There appears to be a need for some controlled levels of inflammation at parturition for the dairy cow in order to restore normal function. The role of fat um, mobilization seems critical to this. How should we think of this in some weight loss? Uh, is some weight loss essential or is the amount of lipolysis needed for immune performance more subtle and not necessarily observable from a body condition standpoint? Okay, uh, complex question, interesting. And it's, it's something we've thought about a lot. So first of all, I agree with your premise that probably some inflammation is necessary at a minimum for uh, giving birth and for helping to uh, push forward on involution of the uterus and such. And I think, you know, we've we've argued that probably even for metabolic adaptation to lactation, it's it's useful at some level. So then the harder question is, to what extent is lipolysis good or bad? Um, and I think here, like most things in biology, um, probably the middle of the road is is helpful and either extreme the other way may not be. Um, in part, you know, and we can point to really extreme uh, examples like 
aquatic mammals, you know, whales or whatever that rely almost entirely on released body fat stores to put, you know, put energy into milk for the, for the baby. Um, but that's, it's a pretty normal thing in early lactation, you know, across species, it's different extremes and different species, but so the average dairy cow is going to mobilize body fat. And I think in most of those cows, it's not really a problem. I do think we have strong enough evidence to say the most extreme ones, it is a problem. Um, it's pretty hard to prove it's because of the NEFA themselves, as opposed to some other process that's going along with that. And we're really interested right now, um, groups like Andres Contreras, who's a colleague of mine at Michigan State, really digging into the, the cells that are present in adipose tissue that are involved in, in lipolysis in the transition cow, and maybe, I don't know this, but maybe when we see high NEFA correlated with problems, maybe it's because that's just a, a flag, if you will, of the cows with really high NEFA, it's because the immune cells in their adipose tissue are inflamed, are not working in the normal way. And as a result, they're not suppressing lipolysis like they should. But at the same time, they're producing inflammatory signals that are causing problems in other organs. So perhaps it's less the NEFA themselves than it is, you know, that's, they're both byproducts of faulty um, sort of immune regulation in adipose tissue. So that's a long-term hypothesis, but that's one way I'm thinking about that question today. All right, very well. We're running a bit long today, folks, but we've got some great questions to come. So if you'll just hang in there for a few moments. Uh, our next question is, does immune activation prepartum affect or prime in some manner the immune functionality of the fetus? Can this be a positive? Should we be considering nutrient signaling to, to the fetus to program a, a more robust immune response after birth? If so, what nutrients? Yeah, fascinating question. And I am not, I'm pretty weak here, to be honest. So um, there are people who specialize in immunology of, um, you know, dam offspring transfer, but cattle are different than, than a lot of species in that they don't rely very much on placental transfer of immunoglobulins or other aspects of immunity. So we all know that's why colostrum is so important, particularly in cattle, uh, for that transfer of passive immunity, um, because that's where they're mostly going to get their IgGs. So that would suggest to me that maybe it's less important in cattle than some other species, where placental transfer is more important. But uh, of course, if if a calf is consuming milk from its dam, um, even that colostrum piece, you could potentially influence through nutrition. And I have seen, you know, and just keeping an eye on the literature, it hasn't really been my group, but there are more and more people that seem to be actually collecting and reporting data on colostrum, which I think is a good uh, development. And I think it might lead us to some surprising insights into how nutrition of dry cows could influence that. So beyond that, of course, programming of the entire physiology of the calf could be influenced by nutrition of the cow all through gestation. Um, that's been studied much more in sheep, basically as a model for humans. Um, but I'm not the best one to sort of share what's been learned there. I, I haven't really kept up on that, to be honest. So interesting question. All right. Joseph uh, is asking, um, when should we use corticosteroids and dexamethasone? Okay. When should you use that? So this is where my lack of veterinary training makes me hesitant to say much. Um, I, you know, Corticosterone is, uh, glucocorticoids are, tend to be immunosuppressive. That's even somewhat controversial. It depends on what you mean by immunosuppressive. Um, they, I, I think the evidence for, you know, where people used to use that as a adjunct treatment for ketosis, I don't think is justified today. I think there's a study out of Guelph where they said there was a certain subset of cattle where that actually was beneficial in a big clinical trial. Um, but in terms of sort of excessive inflammatory responses, I'm sure there are times where that's justified, but I don't feel like I have the background to answer that accurately. Sorry. No, that's fine. And our last question comes from Tani. Is there any reason to think the energy requirement is overestimated in some studies based on the metabolism of glucose? If the innate cells are using glycolysis, 
that lactate goes back to the liver and is made into glucose again. So the same mole of glucose is not being completely oxidized. So its heat of combustion may not be an accurate way to estimate the energy used from it. Thanks, Tony. I don't know if we've talked about this before or not, but if I hadn't thought about this before, that would have been a way too complicated of a question, but you're right. So indirect calorimetry, where we basically just look at uh, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in animals and use that to sort of back calculate their energy burn, typically works fine, but you have to assume uh, a certain, the, the vast majority of energy is generated through oxidative phosphorylation. In an animal, with this extreme glycolytic flux that's anaerobic, that assumption is violated. So if we're using indirect calorimetry in these LPS challenged animals, I would argue that the data is, is yeah, is underestimated. Um, and I've had this discussion with other people that I know this better than I, and they agree with that. So um, I've actually been sort of sniffing around as if anybody that has actual chambers, <laughs> there's not many of those left. Um, could do this sort of this work direct calorimetry wise, you know, with dairy cow, that's a, that's a hugely expensive setup. So great question. Well, that's going to do it for today, folks. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Bradford and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balcam.com and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. Please answer our short three question survey as you exit today's webinar. You will also receive a follow up email within 48 hours with a link to a recording of today's webinar that you can share with others in your organization. Links to past webinars are also available at balchemanh.com slash real science. The Balchem Real Science Lecture Series is moving to a monthly format and webinars will now be presented live on the first Tuesday of every month. Our next webinar titled, Why Cows Become Hypoglycemic and Steps to Reduce Impact will be on August 4th, featuring Dr. Jesse Goff from Iowa State University. Go to balchemanh.com slash real science and click on the register now button to sign up. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Bradford, thank you for joining us today.